Grace, mercy, and peace be with you today through God our Father, and through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We have today the opportunity to ponder the incomprehensible nature of God. Did you hear what I said? Ponder the incomprehensible nature of God. And if your head is already starting to hurt at that conundrum, consider the fact that we've already pushed those ponderings about as far as they can go in the Athanasian Creed. And there are a whole bunch of loose strings hanging out there, aren't there? A whole bunch of things that you might be thinking, huh, but what about this? What about that? What does it mean to continue to ponder the incomprehensible beyond those limits that God has ordained and well? I suggest that you don't, <laughs> but we do believe it, and we confess it, and we aren't going to understand it. We can put words to it, mind you, but really wrapping our heads around it, mastering it, is not in the cards. It's when we try to do exactly that that we end up in the most trouble. The nature of the Holy Trinity, that is the teaching that there is one God and yet three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is one of those teachings in the Bible that our sinful nature is just never going to be satisfied with. Our sinful nature can't stand not knowing the irrationality of it all to our human brains. And many folks are willing to do just about anything to make God make more sense to them. And that is why the teaching of the Holy Trinity is the single most common departure point, off-ramp, out of the Christian faith and into some other direction, as many other different religions have sprung off over the centuries. Tinkering with or trying to understand this teaching, this incomprehensible nature of God as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, will only lead us into trouble. And in order to relate this trouble to you, I would like to relate to you the story of a bricklayer who is asked to explain in greater detail to his insurance company how it is that he came about the injuries that he received on an on-the-job accident. Dear sir, he writes, I'm a bricklayer by trade. On the day of the accident, I was working alone on the roof of a new six-story building. When I completed my work, I found I had some bricks left over, which, when weighed, were later found to be slightly in excess of 500 pounds. Rather than carry the bricks down by hand, I decided to lower them in a barrel using a pulley, which was attached to the side of the building at the sixth floor. Securing the rope at ground level, I went up to the roof, swung the barrel out, loaded the bricks onto it, and then I went down and untied the rope, holding it tightly to ensure a slow descent of the bricks. You will note in block 11 of the accident report that my weight is 135 pounds. Due to my surprise at being jerked off the ground so suddenly, I lost my presence of mind and forgot to let go of the rope. Needless to say, I proceeded at a rapid rate up the side of the building. In the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel, which was now proceeding downward at an equally impressive rate of speed. This explains the fractured skull, minor abrasions, and broken collarbone, as listed in Section 3 of the accident report form. Slowed only slightly, I continued my rapid ascent, not stopping until my fingers and my right hand were two knuckles deep into the pulley. Fortunately, by this time, I had regained my presence of mind and was able to hold tightly to the rope in spite of the excruciating pain I was now beginning to experience. At approximately the same time, however, the barrel of bricks hit the ground and the bottom fell out of the barrel. Now devoid of the weight of the bricks, that barrel weighed approximately 50, 50 pounds. I refer you again to my weight. As you might imagine, I began a rapid descent down the side of the building, and in the vicinity of the third floor, I met the barrel coming up again. This accounts for the two fractured ankles, a broken tooth, and severe lacerations on my leg and body. Here my luck began to change slightly. The encounter with the barrel seemed to slow me enough to lessen my injuries when I fell into the pile of bricks, and fortunately, only three vertebrae were cracked. 
I'm sorry to report, however, as I lay there on the pile of bricks, in pain, unable to move, I again lost my composure and presence of mind and let the rope go. And I lay there watching the empty barrel begin its journey back to me. And this accounts for the two broken legs. This is a classic case of somebody who should have just let well enough alone, isn't it? There simply is no way of starting down the path of trying to understand the Trinitarian nature of God without getting ourselves into deep spiritual pain and trouble. So what's our task today then? To confess the Trinity as an article of our faith? Well, we've already done that in the Athanasian Creed, isn't it that we've done that? That we declare that we don't understand it and we're not going to be able to wrap our heads around it? Well, on one level, yes, and we've already done that too. The nature of God is incomprehensible, and yet God deigns to get down on our level so that we can understand him in a way that he allows, and so we accept it, and we believe it, and we confess it. And if that was all there is to it, it'd be enough. We're not in a position to sit back and critique God, are we? But there is more to it than that. Today, we have the opportunity to sit back and enjoy God. Let me say that again. We have the opportunity to sit back and enjoy God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By faith, we're gathered here into his presence. By faith, we're able to belong here in this place. By faith, we're given the grace to know him and know about him. And then the privilege to do what our kids did all through the school year here at Mountain View in this, their theme verse for the year, which was to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So how often is it that we sit back and we enjoy God, bask in that glow? Have you ever thought about it that way before? It's probably not the way that we most often think about God, is it? Respect, yes. Revere, absolutely. Honor, yeah. Fear, love, and trust, yes. But enjoy, that sounds a little odd. I want you to picture God the Father in your mind's eye, if you will. Most people, when they picture God the Father, picture him seated on the throne in heaven. They picture a flowing white beard, a stern look on his face, ready to judge those things which are against his will. Many people think of that. But let me ask you, can you remember a time when a parent or a grandparent or some other important person in your life who was close to you filled you with a sense of security and peace just by who they are and by their being with you? Can you think about that time? Can you think about a time when you were filled with anxiety or fear and a parent's presence calmed you and brought you back to that place of comfort. How precious those kinds of people are to us, aren't they? That's just a small picture of what our Father is able to do for us. I remember when I was a small kid, I was scared of a monster in the closet. Very common trope, I know, but that was me. I would look into my closet at night, I would see the shadows of my clothes or whatever in there, and imagine that some monster was going to come out and get me. Irrational, of course, but it doesn't matter because it was real to me in that moment and it was a real fear. But when I was with my parents, guess what? I wasn't afraid anymore. What a blessing it is to us that we have that holy, almighty God, majestic, who is yet also our Father, who is able to provide for us, watch out for us, be present with us, protect us, and give us the comfort of exactly that. That's something to be enjoyed, isn't it? Now I want you to think back to a time when you received an amazing gift. What is that gift 
that you received? And how did you feel about the giver of that gift in that moment when they gave you that incredible gift? What was your attitude about them? Again, just a small picture of what God has done for us, but in giving himself for us, God the Son has given us the greatest gift ever. In spite of our sinfulness, he chose to swap with us on his cross to take our sin and instead to give us the best gift imaginable, holiness that makes us right to be able to stand in our Heavenly Father's presence. That's the gift that Jesus gives to us. And yet Jesus is also not only a God whose concern is what kind of life we live or only whether or not we're saying or doing the right thing. Rather, he's the kind of God who can make himself into our brother to help to lead us and guide us out of those places where we ought not to be and to show us another way. Sometimes, I think that we need to just sit back and enjoy. Kind of like you might a beautiful sunset here in our desert of what God, the Son, our brother, has done in giving us this gift. By the way, the Holy Spirit gives us reason to enjoy as well. And again, I want you to think back this time to a time when you received an awesome message, wonderful news. Do you have that time in your mind? The most recent of those for me was on November 11th of this last year. It was out on the Loop Road at Red Rock, that highest point on the Loop Road, when I knelt down and proposed to my fiance and asked her if she would marry me. And the wonderful news from Jen was, yes, I will. And then I think back and I consider all the events surrounding that day and how awesome it all was. And, all of the rejoicing we've been able to do in the months since and looking ahead at whatever it is that is in store for us for our future in the years to come. You see, the Holy Spirit, too, is one who has brought us the best possible news, the message of salvation in, our son, in, in God's Son, Jesus, who has done this remarkable thing that makes a profound difference in our life. That is, bring us to faith. Help us to be able to remember who He is. You've been given the blessing of baptism, and so have I. I don't remember mine. I was only six weeks old when I got baptized. But remembering it isn't the thing that gives it any power. What gives it power is the promise of God that is at work. And I can still sit back on that promise and give thanks to God and have for those things that God has done for me over the years. To sit back and enjoy a God who loves me enough to say, even at a time when I can't remember him, I claim you, I love you, you're adopted into my family, you're mine. And so we can enjoy the fact that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit continues to be with us, protecting us, strengthening our faith, using God's tools of word and holy communion in order to bind us ever more closely to him and change me through his power, ever more in the way that he would have me be. Have you ever seen the movie Groundhog Day? That old movie on, maybe you saw it in the theater, or maybe you've seen it on TV in the years since. I like that movie, and one of the reasons that I do is there is this incredible transformation of the main character in the movie who's played by Bill Murray. And the premise of the movie is that he's a reporter who's in whatever that town in Pennsylvania is with the groundhog, I don't remember what that's called, uh, Puxeltani maybe, I can't remember. But he's, he's there, and he is reporting on Groundhog Day, and he is cursed to need to keep reliving this day over and over. And as the movie starts off, he is this rude, arrogant, self-centered guy that no one likes, and he doesn't really like anyone either. But he keeps waking up the next morning, repeating exactly the same day over and over again, February 2nd. And at first, he uses this weird state of events to just serve himself, to indulge in whatever it is that he wants to do and to have no consequences with it the next day. But as time goes on, he starts to find all of this rather meaningless. And so he starts to find ways to remove himself from that day proactively. And then he keeps waking up 
same day again, and he keeps looking for new ways to end his life over and over again until his focus starts to turn from himself and indulging his own sense of lack of meaning to looking at the people around him and how he can be a help and how he can be a blessing. And the days keep repeating, but what he finds in that repetition is that there are opportunities for blessing and love to be able to go forward right in the middle of those same difficult circumstances. And then those things that were previously considered a curse can suddenly be imbued with hope to be enjoyed and blessed. This is just a glimpse of the kind of thing that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit does and when he changes us. Doesn't necessarily change the circumstances around us, but he does work at changing us. And as he does, we learn to accept and endure and grow in patience and sometimes even to bless those circumstances where our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has this interest in showing us his love, involving himself in our lives, dealing with us in amazing ways. So today, as we celebrate this beautiful nature of God, how can we not sit back at times and simply enjoy that he's our God? That's what we get to do today, and I hope that this message has helped you to do that. All praise be to our triune God, in Jesus' name, amen. And now may that peace which surpasses all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen.